Thank you for having me. Um, I'm honored to be in the Fox, just to be up here. I mean, you don't get this opportunity often to be a presenter here, so um, thank you for the sound too and all of our hosts for having me. It's really special. So yes, you, most of you know me. I know you know me and you had the bread um, and make sure you eat up that bread so I don't have to take it back to the bakery. But yeah, pleasure to be here. Um, and everyone here has tried the bread, is that correct? Yeah, yeah? okay. So. Super, yeah, just trying to make the most, the healthiest bread for our community and then just provide some inspiration. You know, there's a lot of intangibles that are in that bread that I don't always talk about, but I do love to talk about when I have the chance. And that's the energy and love that goes into it. And uh, <clears throat> the years of practice and sacrifices I've made along the way um, to bring it to the community. So really, I want to serve my community. It's kind of like up front with my business, uh, serving community and the community connections. So title of my presentation is Hydrating Community because I think this is what means life, you know, bringing life to a community, um, for a community to flourish. This is one of the resources that are important to us and it's about how we are mindful of spending that resource. So this to me just means bringing life. So my history as a baker started about 28 years ago, kind of a roundabout way to getting where I am today. but. Uh, I think it makes sense right now. <laughs> so I started out um, having my first bakery as the Village Baker, and that was in Flagstaff, Arizona. I moved to Flagstaff after studying anthropology at the university and went up there for a summer to play around, you know, be in the mountains, and I found myself the first day landing a job as a baker. I was told to come try out. It was a real kind of a guys club there. And to go try out, but I went that night uh, into the bakery after meeting someone on a mountain bike ride to come and try out. But I just fell in love with the whole environment because I was like, wow, I've been in a kitchen working super hard since I was 13, you know, been a line cook, dishwasher, all the, you know, prep cook, all of it. But I really found something special in the bread and that was you can bring life to a product. You can bring some leaven to it, watch it grow, be there to care for it and then try to like just shape it along the way, nurture it along the way to have this outcome. And then in the end you have this product you feed people. And I thought, wow, all the stuff I love about, you know, life and community and, and meals is about, you know, having something at the end you show, you show for and it's part of you. So in, yeah, 1995, I had worked, you know, five years as a baker and then in 1995, after studying after, under some really good people and going to so one year of business school, I wrote a business plan and I was uh, funded to start the Village Baker in 95. So I was 25 years old, super young, but I felt like I had so much energy and uh, support behind me, I would go for it. After running the Village Baker in Flagstaff in Ashland, Oregon, I kind of got overwhelmed at the end of the career. I had 40 people that I worked for, or that worked for me and I was 29 years old, most of them my friends, which was a challenge. But then I thought, okay, I need to figure out life. What should I do? And I'm kind of at the, at the brink of a collapse. I love the bread, but I love the business, but I found myself doing less of the baking and more of the managing. And so I decided I would make a switch, a kind of intermittent switch, and I became a school teacher. I went back to the University of Arizona, got a degree in education. And that made sense to me because I had been educating along the way. Everything I was doing is teaching people uh, how to do and set up these learning environments for them. So I became a school teacher. As a school teacher, I was thinking, how do I get back into bread? How do I get into a bakery? I love it. I made bread once a week for my school community. And that was with me the whole time. I thought, oh, I love it. But the economics weren't right. 2008, we all felt this, a crash. And there was no lending. I went to the bank and I was devastated. I was saying, I had this amazing company, you know, two bakeries, multi-million dollar, I, I did well, why don't, why can't I get a loan? And there was no money, no lending, so I thought, okay, lesson my dad taught me. If you don't have the money to spend, you can't spend it. Figure out some way of getting around that. My dad, real tough, you know, Mexican guy, like, we have to start working, we're eight years old, work, work, work. 
And I was like, oh my God, shoe shining, you know, my dad's barber shop. It taught me a lot of lessons though. Don't give up, persevere, and good things come. These lessons, you know, about um, these tough working lessons. So I thought, huh, I've been to Mexico. I love the bakeries that are inside houses. I used to go to Rocky Point and go to this bakery where I'd look inside the, the retail area, but I'd look down the hallway and I'd see the family watching TV or something. I'm like, that is so cool. Like, I'm gonna do it. Or travel through Europe, you know, in, in France where there's a lot of bakeries that are below apartments. And I thought, ooh, this is something I wanna try. So I had this crazy idea, garage bakery. And everyone said, what, are you crazy? Why would you do that? It doesn't make sense. Around that time, there was legislation that was passed by Jan Brewer, and it was uh, the Cottage Food Law of Arizona. And I thought, whew, I can try this. I can license my bakery and have state, you know, state license to do it. And I did that. And I worked with my father-in-law, who's an engineer, and it's like, he's retired. It was like a project, you know, I pitched to him, and he said, no, no, it's not gonna work. I wouldn't do it. And then I wouldn't stop. I wouldn't stop, ah, huh, well, I, you know, I had these plans, I could share them with you, and then I said, okay, let's see what we can do. So eventually, the garage bakery. Then it was eight years as a solo baker in my garage. I almost lost it, I tell you, I almost lost it. Started talking to myself a lot, it was crazy. And about that time, when I was just at the end, I was thinking, okay, I have this, I saved up about $120,000. Eight years, I paid myself that teacher salary. I worked my butt off 900 loaves a week. I saved all my money. And I thought, I'm still short. I still need $100,000 or so. So I started applying for grants. I applied for two grants, struck out. I thought, one more grant, three strikes are out rule. I applied for a USDA grant. I waited about five months for that grant to come back. One day, opened my computer. Choo, USDA said, we want to award you a $100,000 grant for the work you're doing in Tucson to build a local green economy. We love you're an educator. You're sharing this with the public and people seem to love your bread. We've done a ton of research on you. You're gonna be one of the 16 people in America that have applied for this grant that will get it. $100,000, yeah. So, you can't imagine that morning. I just dropped to my knees and I'm like, oh, thank you. It was amazing. But that's what provided the money to what you see now. On Broadway and Country Club, Broadway Village, my bakery is a result of a USDA local food promotion grant. 28, or you know, at that time, 26 years of hard work, dedication, um, but also investing in my community, a different way of doing business. The business I have now is a community support enterprise. That's what I call it. And of course, unorthodox, but everything had a purpose. So here's me, 25 years old, Flagstaff, Arizona. The title baker fills a need in town. Yeah, so that was me. And you can see that oven is still similar to what I have now. But 25 years old, super proud of that bakery. My last year teaching, I was awarded uh, Teacher of the Year, Arizona. And uh, it was kind of a tough time to leave. My principal said, this doesn't make sense. You want to retire? But I said, but bread is my love. I want to teach bread. I want to do this. I, I'm sorry, but amazing. I was so honored to get that award to my garage bakery, you know, and uh, I, I loved it. I still, I still, uh, you know, look at this and nostalgic for what it was, but it was a beautiful setting. Now I get to go around the world and teach us in Taiwan. I've been working the last three years. Uh, people are constantly sending me photos of their garage bakeries. And I think, wow, the CSB worked in, in Asia. Now it's all over. It's licensed, just like we have the licensing here to do it. So this makes me feel good. But I love to share this picture, just simple. And the commute, wow, look at that. <laughs> That's pretty awesome, huh? Yeah, T-shirts and shorts all day long. Yeah. And then my current spot, the Village Baker. And, you know, super proud of this building. Super, super proud of what I've done here. Um, this is just before the opening, just so you could see that remodeling going on. I have eight wonderful staff that are very supportive. They believe in my mission and vision. Several of them I've known for years and they've worked for me just selling bread at the farmer's market. So there it is, my history as a baker, Barrio Bread. So really tying the theme of water into this presentation, water is the biggest, the most important. If you measured it, you know, in volumes or weight or whatever, it is the most important part of bread. People think it's flour, all right? In my case, it is water. It makes up 80% of the final loaf of bread. 
but it also takes the water to grow the grain. And this is something, you know, I pitched to the USDA. Okay, I have four acres um, of test, test wheat. This is, a, this is a project that started with Native Seed Search, came on as their test baker, to reinvigorate the local grain economy by planting white Sonoran wheat, and it was chapalote corn, the other crop. So there was a SARE grant, Sustainable Agriculture Research Education Grant, to fund this and recruit farmers. But really, what I've thought about what is it to, to bring life to the grain, it takes water, but it's how we use that water and is it an investment in the grain? I get this question a lot. Should we be going, growing grains in Tucson, in the desert? You know, now there's, I have with BKW 120 acres of wheat, six varieties. But yes, it does make sense. Barrio bread's a unique process. It's a long fermentation process. The health benefits, it's low glycemic, low gluten bread. Through fermentation, acidification, you can lower pH, activate enzymes to break down, to denature proteins and to convert starches into complex carbohydrate. Preserving a tradition, you know, Levan baking, my bread is thousands and thousands of years old. The technique has not changed. It's very simple. You know, it's mechanization, it's industrialization, it's the creation of Saccharomyces yeast in laboratories that have changed all that, but I stay with natural leaven, sourdough culture bread. And this is where you see the health benefits. Years ago, years ago, we've learned this from history. History has it right. We've, the most healthful products, you know, fermented foods right now are popular, but it's not like a, a new thing, right? This is the fermented bread. This is the healthful bread. This is the way of doing it and why, why people smile after they eat the bread, right? Connection of the GI with the facial muscles in the brain. It feels good too. <laughs> yeah, I see it a lot. Everyone in that shop is smiling, just smelling it. And the samples don't hurt either, so come for the samples. It's a distraction. Um, yeah, and creating a product that resembles a Sonoran Desert. So when I craft the breads, when I, even when I select the grains to grow, so I'm very fortunate to be able to, to you have input on that. Okay, what grain should be grown here? First and foremost, is it sustainable? Is this a grain that can do well in this climate? So recruiting some seeds from, you know, for example, Khorasan from desert to desert, from Iran to Tucson, you know. There's Khorasan is a region in Iran where the, wheat, where the wheat belt is located. So this is a grain, a beautiful golden wheat berry that, that is grown here now. And I select those seeds based on pigments, protein levels, and then um, flavor, this expression, this potential for expression of flavor and texture. But really, it's that variety of grains that I love and looking at these unique grains, but they have to be sustainable here. And my commitment is that as the world changes, as we change climatically, that I will adopt and grow along with the farmers the grains that are most appropriate. It might not be the bread you see out there or today. I'm committed to that, though, because that's the most, most important part and how we spend our water. Are these grains like lower input? Yes, for water. Yes, looking at ancient, modern, and heritage wheats. That's important to me, preserving these traditions of grain growing and not only the baking. And I tell you, the, the pigments of them too. I, select on, I told you I select on pigments. The colors, and we see this in genetic variability, all these different colors of wheat. In wheat in America, we see hard red spring primarily. So it's this tan rust brown. But these wheats are, that I have are all different colors, and I blend them like an artist, like a paints on a palette to make the expression of the bread come out. So when you look at that body of bread rack, you see the desert, you see these tans, rust, blondes, browns, all those colors you'd see in a sunset, in the desert scape. And that's, that's the artisanal side of baking. But it's bread terroir, so you, you taste that flavor. That is the soil, that is the desert. And that's, you know, coming from the baker, but also the soil and the, and the farms. So Levan, I told you about Levan. Any, everyone knows sourdough. Everyone's had sourdough bread. I'm taking it, you all know sourdough bread. The benefits, I told you, low glycemic and low gluten bread. This is, and Levan is a French term, mostly French trained. I learned from a man from Paris when I was 20, 21 years old. And uh, he taught me a lot about bread. <clears throat> and I just never stopped since then. Here you go. These wild yeast and bacterial cultures take up residence in this flour and water batter and they leaven it. This is what I add to more flour, water, salt to make a dough. So sourdough is basically a bread dough without salt. 
but it be, this is inoculation, this wild yeast bacterial cultures, like I said, they take up residence, they grow, they multiply, and this is what leavens more bread. So I start with a nugget of maybe 500 grams of starter every day. It's called a chef. You take a piece of that, you put it in, a, in buckets, you feed it flour and water, and I can grow 50 kilos off of 500 grams in a 24-hour cycle. Huge appetite, these microbes, they have a huge appetite for starches and they love it, but really my, my bakery is, is really taking care of these microbes. So I got a little lab there, and these little microbes, these little gremlins I have to take care of every day. And it's not a good day when someone forgets to feed them because I can't make bread the next day. It's happened one day, someone forgot to feed the sourdough, you know, and I come in the morning, nothing. How do you explain to your community you cannot make bread? I can't make your bread. They're looking at me like I'm crazy. Really, without these little critters, I can't do it. So that's why it's special to take care of them. So it's a mother of my bread and my business. The health benefits I told you about. It's preserving a tradition. And this is why I bake with Levan. It's important to me to carry that tradition. And that's why I'm teaching so many people in our community to do it. I've taught over 700 people in this community. This community alone how to make bread. And I'm talking tens, thousands of people that I've taught how to make bread along the way. I think it's important, always teach, reteach. We don't want <clears throat> any of these traditional practices to go away. And we see that now. A lot of people are catching on this, artisanal businesses, wine, beer makers, cheese makers. It part, becomes part of the business, of sharing that, teaching it, reteaching it. And so it can grow. And like young men like this, Chef Abel, he has a great start. If you don't know his tortillas, you should. I saw him at the bakery now. Yeah. But this is his family's tradition and part of my tradition, you know, my family's from Magdalena, Mexico, and I'm half Irish, half Mexican. I'm totally confused, but I love to party. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, tortillas have been part of my diet for sure and something I learned from my nana. And I love that he came in one day with his family and, and shared what he wanted to do with me. And then we got him going. He's doing great. But that's part of carrying on a tradition of his family. So local whole grain flowers. This, my hand out in a wheat field and it's just so special to get out there in the wheat fields in all stages from the planting to the growing to the harvest to check it out. But here you go. Some of the local flowers that grow in Arizona include Durham, Coruscant, White Sonoran Wheat, Hard Red Spring, Red Fife. There's so many more that are coming too. And this is what I want to share with you. Building a, a bread culture in Tucson based on, on native grains, local grains. Some of these other grains are recruited but grow well in the desert. And what makes it unique? In my business, and when I started in the garage, like I told you, had to be innovative. I'm one person. How do I make, how do I make a living being one person baking out of a garage? And this was a concern of everybody. They said, you're about to leave this amazing teaching job with TUSD and go out into the unknown. But I am so determined as, a, as an entrepreneur and, you know, just as a person that I'm going to do it. And this has kind of been the way I do is like I see I have a vision and I get a little bit of like know-how and I just go for it. But so far it's proven itself well. And that's what, you know, for me it was like calculated risk. You know, study enough, get enough study behind you, get some innovative ideas and go for it. But what I've done, my success has been the community around me that's provided inspiration. And it was like all step of the way when I took that 70 loaves of bread to the farmer's market for the first day, it was like, Wow, check that out, you know, and that's what's got me going. But I've had to employ some innovative techniques. So right now I use, I've used a lot of technology, especially with the Garage Bakery, using Shopify, different ways of selling my bread, innovative practices for selling. I mean, I sold at four schools. Who's, what kind of baker? It's like the ice cream man. I used to sell bread. I'd drive my van and I'd show up at Second Street Children's School, pop up in the back. I'd have a line of people, like 30 people waiting, and I would just go right out of my back bread dough for dough, you know, and just do it. But it was yeah, a couple puns along the way, right? But it was amazing. What I realized is like if in Tucson, if you're doing something that's community supported, community enterprise, something innovative and what, some, what people want and really need, they're going to support you. And this is what I love about our community is that people are really into seeing others succeed. We, we have a lot of pride in the city, and you, can, you, know, you know this from being here. There's a sense of pride that comes from being a Tucsonan. We want to see people do well. We want to have a fun place. We want to know we can do it as a community. From C to E, this is kind of what I've been doing. I, all the support along the way. Yes, 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 let's do it. 
but innovative practices, and there's not one way to do it. The brick and mortar for bakery model is not the way to do it. I mean, I'm doing it now, but this is, I had to do it differently with the community support enterprise, innovative practice, engaging community, transparency. These are the new ways. But for like Chef Abel, all these other people, like Wansa, she's a Iraqi refugee that came to me. We, made, we were in a documentary film together. She's making her naan. She said to me, I really wish I could have a bakery. I wish I could do what you do. And I said, hey, why don't you do like Chef Abel and get yourself licensed under your home. You can develop a brand. I helped her do that. Now she's selling at five, market, five farmers markets in my store on Fridays. She's doing this in Tucson and she started with just making bread out of her home you know, just for a family, and I helped her kind of get started. And these are the ways we need to think. Reach out, help people. Because really, I want to eat that naan too, right? I want to eat that good bread. <laughs> Selfish reasons, yeah, make that naan. But this is a person that's been na making na her naan bread for 40 years in another country. She comes here in America, lands in Tucson. How can I have an industry? How can I do that? Just one step at a time. Lend that hand. So building relationships with, with customers, that's part of the transparency in business. You know, the, my oven is up front. It's an easy way for me to develop a relationship with my customers. My oven's up front. I believe in it. That's why I designed it that way. Not out of space constraints, but because I, I want to see my people come in. Plus, I was in eight years in the garage by myself. So, <laughs> like, I, oh, man, I, I'm telling you. I'm like, hey, what's up? You know? <laughs> People are like, over the top, calm down. But I love seeing people in the morning, all day long, coming in, talking to them. I want to know them. As school teacher rules, like you get to know all your, all your students' names right away. And, I love, and that's always stayed with me and my clients here. And my friends know that. I want everyone is special. I want to make them all feel special because they are. And then serve the niche uh, market of your community. Like I said, innovative practices. Where, where do we need tortillas? Where do we need the naan bread? Where do we need sourdough bread? How can we sell it? You know, this is all part of like plugging into your community, you know? And I thought when I was making out of the garage, I'm no Beyond Bread. And I'm not trying to be Beyond Bread. I'm trying to be Don Guerra, I'm trying to be Barrio Bread, and I'm trying to just serve the community that I can reach. Not, not a, on a grand scale. So I, I always felt, you know, people come to me at the farmer's market, they kind of tap me on the head and say, oh, well, one day you'll have a big bakery. You know, to me, I was like, I got this cool little one, but I'm all right, you know? But it was really like, I think we're seeing that now in Tucson, is like, it doesn't take as big company to do big things, right? You could be one person and have this innovative idea or this the amazing skill, and you can share that and get it out there. Now with dig like social media, I'm telling you, it's the way to do it. Get yourself out there, connect with your community, show it, teach it to them even. And that's where you get engagement, that's where you get support. Yeah, and every community is different. So I've had a lot of people, a lot of people over the years come to me and say, franchise, 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 let's do it, you know, I'll help you do it. But really to me, every community is different. And right now I'm looking more at business modeling than franchising Body of Bread. My bakery is, is really about Tucson. It's about the local grains, it's about the local bread, the local producers, and the local community. And I don't want to put this out there as a franchise because I will not be there with the person making that bread. They are unique to their community, they have a special function, they're a special person. They are using their own local grains, and this is like, I think, business modeling would be a better choice for me to share that, how to engage your local community, your local agriculture, your people, um, you know, what's available to you at that time and your staff or whatever, because every community is different, and this community is special in Tucson, and I'm thankful that I can start it out here. Yeah, and so just another stamp or another show of, local, of this... Uh, you know, localism is putting things on the breads like that stencil, you know. I made that years ago uh, in my garage, and I made, th I made two of them, one with the swirl, and then this one. When I made those, and I was cutting them out, I thought, this could be cool. I pulled that first loaves of bread out with these stencils, and I thought, whoa, this is something. I feel it, you know, and then, like, maybe six months later, it showed up on the uh, front page of the food section of New York Times. This person, like Kim Severson, um, heard of me and she wanted to come to the garage. She came to my garage. At first I said no, 
she called me on the phone. I was busy, and she said, this is Kim Severinsen, a food writer for New York Times. Can I come see you? I'm really interested in your business. I said, Kim, I'm so busy. I'm sorry. I can't do it right now. And I hung up, went back inside the house. My <laughs> wife's like, who's that? Oh, it's, you know, it's Kim Severinsen, New York Times, food writer. She said, what'd you say? I told her I was busy, you know. She's like, what? Get on the phone. Call her back. Kim came to see it, and she was like, this is special. This is like what we're looking for is these, this sort of business that makes huge impact, huge waves, and that made waves across the world with that. And I'm talking, you know, the oven up front, people shopping for bread. It's like a, it, you know, and I equate it to like a wine. You know, people come in and they shop for bread, and there's so many little things I want to tell them about the bread. I want it to be an educated sale. I want to connect with them. I want to find out about their life. So my, I tell my staff too, when people come in, the first question you ask them is not what, you, what do you want, you know, what, what kind of bread, but ask them something about themselves, their lives. How is your morning, you know, and if you know them well enough, how's the family, what you've been up to, how's work, but these other things to engage your community. <clears throat> and so here's see people shopping for bread and I'm, you know, I'm helping them out. I'm love to share it. And that's also a way for me to share with my staff what to say, um, how to talk about the bread, but it's a very important function to me. And I think it's kind of where we're going now is like when you walk in these businesses, you want to know your producer. You want to see him or her or the team or whatever it is. You want to know there's someone behind it making it. And I, and let's talk about circular economy. So the, really this is the idea I have behind, um, what I do, circular economy model is how this whole grain economy functions. So you, as consumers, create a market for me. I create a market for the farmers. If it's a tight system and it's well thought out, we can go round and round and round, and we can afford to do this. Growing local grains in the desert, it's a total gamble. The farmers, when I asked them, they're like, oh, I don't know. We grow these other commodity crops that are you know, we send to Italy or we send these other places, you know, and I said, why not keep it here? The Durham you're sending to Italy for pasta, why don't we grow an organic version that we can keep here in our community? And they were growing cotton before, a lot of cotton, in the Wong family. They're like, wow, they came to a native seed search um, presentation where we try to recruit farmers, and they thought, to keep it in the community, okay, that makes sense. But now they're so proud, we're feeding our people right here. Yeah, so supply meets demand, so important. And I had to really project, now I'm projecting two years out. First of all, what seeds to recruit, then it grows a growing cycle, then I can use that flower in a year, and I have to project it very close. You know, now it's 120 acres that are grown of these heritage wheats. I use about 85 acres. I have a company, Barrio Grains, where I, you know, um, sell them to the community with a lot of know-how. So on my website, recipes, instruction, I started breadlessons.com to further engage people and uh, like how to make bread, not just my life courses, because I never can reach enough people to do that. But this is what I'm doing to sell those grains to make supply meet demand. And if you bought them, if you bought my flour blends, you're making your food, you probably notice there's a big difference between buying something at Safeway off the shelf, and I see you nodding because he's someone that's a baker here in the community making bread. You notice there's a difference. Not a, only a difference in flavor and texture and aromas, but also in the pride you have once you pull that product out of the oven, yeah? Or off the griddle, even pancakes. So it's about mutualism, the grain, the bread, and the bakery. This is also something I'm really focused on too, low carbon footprint. So my you know, goal is to go 100% 100 sustainable in Tucson. All my bread, we've made local, local grains. Right now I start a new flour company, so I have my own flour blend and brand um, in the collaboration with Hayden Flour Mills. So it's called Heritage Precision Blend, and I just showcased it in Vegas for the trade show, first time I launched it. It's coming in my store, and I'll start to use 120,000 pounds of this new blend that has a Bluebeard Durham in it um, in my shop. So now at BKW, Hayden Flour Mills, going Arizona. But low carbon footprint, I want to see my grain being brought in from, you know, the furthest point, 90 miles with Hayden Flour Mills, 20 miles, 22 miles with BKW, this is gonna be my radius. So kind of this, this 100, 100 mile concept that I wanna pitch, a food, hub, a food hub concept. Really it's about a food hub, the bakery is processing now local agriculture, 
serving it to the community, that tight efficiency, tight efficiency circular economy model is what I'm going for. And this is what I like to talk about at the bakery. It's not just a bakery. This is a food hub concept. This is feeding our people with what grows here. And we're along the way engaging a lot of people from farmers, producers, advertising agencies, distributors, you know, all the way down to the final bite. This is what I want for our people. Sustainability in our desert. So our supply chain, this is um, just a week away from harvest white Sonoran wheat out of BKW Farms. I was a little bit thinner then and not as much gray, I think, <laughs> years ago. Um, the farmer, the miller and the baker. So very tight chain there, you know? I don't have a lot of people, not as many distributors in there, but I, wanna, I wanted to make it that to create efficiency. I have to create efficiency if I want to sell that bread at six, seven, eight dollars a loaf, you know, I have one dollar, I even have one dollar breads. I'm trying to pass on that efficiency to my consumers. They don't have to eat the 10, 12, 15, 25 dollar loaf of bread. I want to keep it there. I try to create that for the consumers to pass on. The farmers, how many people have heard of uh, BKW Farms in Marana? Yeah? Amazing, yeah? I met them years ago. 2011. I started working with Hayden Flour Mills and Chris Bianco and Sussman Farms in 2011. A year later, BKW uh, Farms came in, into the scene. Farming in Arizona since 1939. Started with cotton, collaborated with me to grow different grains for local breads. And one of the, the members of the Long family here, Ralph Long, proud farmer, huh? He's growing the grain, feeding his people, for sure. And then, yeah, and I'm thankful for BKW. We've developed this, you know, this relationship. It's amazing. We have a lot of trust in each other. And I told them years ago, trust me, trust me, trust me. And I'm that kind of person. I'll always, I'll develop relationship. That's what my business is, developing a relationship. And I'm kind of selling smiles right now. I think at the bakery, I look around, everyone's smiling. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. But really, I'm into it for the relationship. But we all know about UNESCO, right? The City Gastronomy, wow, clap your hands for the City Gastronomy. Yeah, first city in North America for City Gastronomy. So we're going to leverage this war to further the agricultural and gastronomical culture. So preserving traditions, you know, we have a long-standing tradition and heritage of, of farming in Arizona, and this is one of the reasons why we got the designation. But I say create, share, collaborate, knowledge networks. This is the part that's most important to me. So people, when they think of Tucson, they think of city gastronomy, they're thinking chimichangas, they're thinking burritos, or all these foods. It's like, okay, that's part of it. But the other part is how we share. And I think this is why my model fits in so well, not only with the ag and processing down local agriculture and food of concept, but for me, it's these knowledge networks. Through knowledge, you create sustainability, through Collaboration and relationship, you create sustainability, right? Furthering these cultural traditions of our foods, our farming practices, the way we share, the way we teach, these are all important ways to create sustainability in our community. And this is what a big part of my business is. When I talk about community, and I'm not just talking local, I'm talking national, I'm talking international. I've had the privilege of traveling around the world lately, a lot in the last two, three years, to teach and to share. But there's been times I've called my friends in Europe and said, I need your help. I'm struggling with this or that. How would you approach it? Then they're more willing to share with me. This is when I'm going to create, create sustainability around the world by sharing this concept that I have with bakery, food hub concept. But this is what's happening now. The more I give, the avalanche of receiving is coming back. Long ago, someone said, Don, you shouldn't give out, you shouldn't teach people these amazing recipes you have and share it because then they'll do it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is totally wrong. We need to be educators. We need to be stewards of, of all this traditional knowledge and share it. And once I realized that I need to share it, because this one woman said to me after I heard that, she said, if you open your hands, you can both give and you can receive. Mm. It hit me, then I had to like, bring the educator back to me and share that. And since sharing that, I mean, this community, these people here, that avalanche of support that's come back to me, and you are my inspiration. 
but this is what it is for me. This is why UNESCO, and this is why our city of gastronomy is thriving. You think about the sort of attitude we have now, even in the gastronomy scene in Tucson, have you ever seen so many chefs collaborate? Like, really? You have all these different events, like bread and brew, you know, you have all these amazing dinners where you're recruiting all these chefs to work together in a kitchen. I didn't see that three, four, five, six years ago. I'm seeing it so much more now. And this is Tucson. Yeah, and that's what I said. <clears throat> Building relationships build sustainability. Education in my community. This little boy um, in Taiwan, I show, showed a group of rural kids in Taiwan how to make pizza. It was really cool. I went to this, this village or in this bakehouse, amazing wood-fired bakehouse, and I asked the kids, okay, there's 20, 20 of them or so. I said, all right, we're going to make pizza through a translator, of course, Mandarin. We're going to make pizza. How many people love to eat pizza? And then there was nobody raising their hands. <laughs> how many people have heard of pizza? This little boy raises his hand, and his friend goes, you have not? <laughs> no, they have never heard of pizza. I was there to do a pizza demo because my host, chef, he knew he could see my pizza on my Facebook videos. And he was like, will you teach these kids? First time I'm teaching this little guy how to stretch a dough. I left there. I left Tainan in this village. They have pizza night every Friday. People from, <laughs> people from the community come and volunteer. They, and this wood-fired bakery, is really Shishan Bakery, amazing. This woman has in her home, just like mine, but wood-fired, beautiful studio. But these kids are coming in once in a while, and they get to help out. They get to make pizzas, and this is they're going to be. Hey, beat, I beat Domino's there. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> but they're going to be making pizza in Chishan Wood Fired Bakehouse. You know, and this is going to be part of what they do. But it was a beautiful moment for me. In Mexico, working with this young chef in a startup restaurant with, with my my friend Javier Placencia, he's kind of premier chef, to, uh, farm to table chef in Ensenada, in Valle de Guadalupe and Tijuana and San Diego, but this boy, this young man, he said, I hate baking. I, they keep me out here in this bakery because I had said, Javier, let's get a little bakery there. It'll be cool if you have this bakery outside of the kitchen. It'll be separate, a glass window people can see in. But he, was he said, all I do is make this one bread. They showed me how to do it. I'm bored. I hate it. Spent three days with him. He wants, he's on a mission to become the best baker in central Mexico, and he's after it right now. 24 years old, and he's determined he's going to be the next one. So, <clears throat> little inspiration, a little bit of teaching, a little bit of sharing. Wow, we hung out night and day. He, when we both left, we're like, oh man, sorry to see you go, but we got to do this. Still in contact. He can't get out of the country right now, but we've, planned, uh, we've tried to meet up in Rocky Point. That's his hometown, but he's living in Valle de Guadalupe. We tried to meet up there in, San, in, in uh, Rocky Point on that side of the border. The bakery of the future. So this is kind of what I'm pitching when I, when I go on travels. This is what I'm sharing and teaching about. Promotion of community, building community through bread. That's my mission statement for Barrio Bread. Sit plain and simple, connecting community through bread. That is my mission statement, and that's what I see. Transparency in business. Show what you do, share what you do, invite people in, make them a part of it. You are just as much a part of my bakery as anyone else's. Without you, I have nothing. You are a part of it. Without buying that bread, like I said, I have no market. You, you provide the market to me. I have no market for the grains if you're not buying the bread from me. And then bread terroir. We just get to celebrate Tucson. The colors of the bread, the texture of the bread, the look of the bread. I want to make it Tucson. You come in there, you're proud to buy that Tucson loaf. It's a taste of the place. Yeah? And a focus on health. This is really important to me. I cannot have return customers if they don't feel good, like I said, your GI is connected to your, your, your brain and your facial muscles. I want you to smile and come back. And that's why I have people just pounding down the doors for that bread right now. Because it feels good, people, right? You eat it. It's not just enjoyable, but it's not the sugar spike high and low. Then you're like, hmm, I feel guilty. You know, It's about feeling good. It's about connecting with the community. The community of the, is the bakery, meeting people there, sharing that that feeling of like, wow, I'm part of this. And people come in all the time, they say, I have like four loaves of bread in the freezer, but I just want to come in, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, hey, what's up, Sally? You know, and we talk, and then you maybe just buy like a roll and then leaves, but it's part of it. <laughs> and sourdough and regional grains. This is what it is, and this is what I want to share with the rest of the world, and I'm starting to see this more and more and more. It's a celebration of community. 
the bakery. And my friend from Taiwan, who's hosted me there several times, um, an amazing man, Philip Wu. And there you go. That is my presentation. Thank you.